Please note today's session is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Hello, everyone. This is Jordan Tompkins, and on behalf of the National Cancer Institute and the Research to Reality team, I would like to welcome you to our March 2017 Cyber Seminar, Expanding Lynch Syndrome Screening from Research to Reality. Research to Reality is NCI's online community of practice that provides a space for cancer control researchers and practitioners to learn, discuss, and collaborate. I would like to invite you to become a member of R2R by creating an account at researchtoreality.cancer.gov. If you would like to receive R2R cyber seminar announcements in the future, please sign up for the Cancer Control Planet e-newsletter at cancercontrolplanet.cancer.gov. We will send out links for both of those through the chat box momentarily. A few notes on logistics. All lines have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the cyber seminar. We encourage you to submit questions by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type in your question and select all panelists before hitting submit. Feel free to submit your question at any time, and we will open the floor for our presenters to answer the questions during the last 20 minutes of the webinar. Each presenter will speak for about 10 minutes, leaving us with plenty of time at the end for questions. You can request slides after today's presentation by emailing us at researchtoreality at mail.nih.gov. I think that takes care of my housekeeping, so let's begin. Today, I'm delighted to welcome all our presenters, Dr. David Chambers, Ms. Heather Hample, Dr. Greg Ciro, and Ms. Deborah Duquette. Dr. Chambers will reflect on the NCI-hosted workshop, Approaches to Blue Ribbon Panel Recommendations, the Case of Lynch Syndrome, that took place in late February. Then we'll jump into three engaging presentations and current work being done related to Lynch syndrome screening practices. So without further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks to everybody for uh, joining us. Of course, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and uh, we thought that this would be a good chance uh, to reflect on uh, some uh, great work that our, our speakers are doing, as well as some recent events that we at the NCI have been engaged in. Uh, Lynch syndrome, uh, which confers a much, much higher risk of uh, colorectal cancer, as, uh, endometrial cancer, as well as other cancers, uh, has had uh, a number of different reports surrounding it that have advocated for uh, enhanced screening, particularly for those uh, with uh, colorectal cancer and, and their relatives. Um, for example, in 2009, the uh, EGAP, Evaluation of Genomic uh, Applications and Practice and Prevention, did a review uh, where they found that uh, screening would be a benefit uh, for relatives of colorectal cancer patients who were diagnosed with uh, Lynch syndrome. And so the ability to cascade from that uh, initial proband who has colorectal cancer to other relatives was seen even uh, those many years ago as being a benefit. Uh, the next year in 2010, Healthy People 2020 identified as a goal trying to uh, increase the proportion of diagnosed colorectal cancer patients who were tested for Lynch. Uh, and when uh, the, the moonshot that was uh, kicked off uh, last year um, as a broad way to think about how can we advance cancer care and research uh, was, uh, was initiated, the follow-up activity for the National Cancer Institute was the convening of a blue ribbon panel. Uh, which would be a, a set of experts who would get together and think through what are the true next uh, steps that we should take for cancer research to make as large an impact as soon as possible on our knowledge of cancer and what we can do to try and reduce the cancer burden overall. Uh, one of those seven work groups that got together focused on precision prevention and early detection, and they proposed as part of their uh, work group discussion the idea that a demonstration project uh, potentially around Lynch syndrome could improve the identification of, of those with, uh, with this syndrome across the U.S. and that we might want to think about the various aspects of what it would take to scale up that kind of screening to the high-risk population who might be able to benefit uh, if, uh, if, if uh, that identification of Lynch syndrome had happened. Uh, the Blue Ribbon panel uh, gave uh, their report to the NCI last fall uh, and our colleagues, uh, both within the Division of Cancer Prevention and the Division of Cancer Control Population Sciences, uh, pulled together a workshop last month, February 22nd and 23rd, uh, to really think about hereditary cancers overall and what can we learn from the case of Lynch syndrome. At this two-day meeting, there were a wide variety of topics.
starting with the biological basis of Lynch syndrome and then thinking about what does implementation need to look like across all different health systems and communities. And we were particularly fortunate to have the three speakers who are going to follow me to share their expertise and their experience at, at the meeting. Uh, they and others at the meeting gave uh, the National Cancer Institute a lot to think about as it considers next steps. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that you had the same chance to benefit uh, from, from Greg, from Heather, and from Deb's expertise as we did. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Heather um, and just uh, thank all of you for joining us and, and we'll look forward to a, a great set of presentations. Hi everyone, it's really uh, exciting to be here. I am looking forward to talking to you about some of the work we've done at Ohio State on universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, which is a way to identify as many patients with Lynch syndrome as possible by doing a screening test on the tumor when um, a person undergoes surgery for their cancer and the tumor is sent to the pathology department. We'll start with just some basics about Lynch syndrome. It's the most common inherited cancer syndrome in the world, affecting over 1.2 million individuals in the United States alone. It's an inherited condition that causes high risk for colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, stomach cancer, ovarian cancer, and several other cancers. But the main cancers associated with Lynch syndrome are really preventable with earlier and more frequent screening. For example, starting colonoscopy at age 20 to 25 repeating it every one to two years has been shown to be extremely effective at preventing uh, colon cancers among individuals with Lynch syndrome. But the key is identifying those individuals so they can benefit from that screening. And this is where the problem lies because we estimate that 95% of people with Lynch syndrome are not aware of their diagnosis. So a lot of our efforts, including our efforts on universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, are trying to help close this gap so that the people out there who have Lynch syndrome can get identified and benefit from this increased screening. So there's something unusual about Lynch syndrome that allows us to do screening in the pathology department, and this really is actually lucky um, because this is not something that we can do for other hereditary cancer syndromes, for example, with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes that are responsible for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, there aren't uh, readily available tumor tests that can help diagnose patients with the condition. So the interesting thing about Lynch syndrome is that it's caused by mutations in a family of genes that are known as the repair genes. And when those genes aren't working properly, it leads to a characteristic in the tumor called microsatellite instability. And this is just a sign that repair is not working. This test is positive for about 15% of colorectal cancer patients and about 24% of endometrial cancer patients. And it identifies a group of patients that are more likely to have Lynch syndrome. It's not diagnostic because not everybody with microsatellite instability has Lynch syndrome but it is a screening test to tell you who's more likely to have it. There's also very good antibodies for the four uh, proteins that are made by the Lynch syndrome genes. And so if those Lynch syndrome genes are working properly, those four proteins will be present in the tumor. And if any of those genes are not working properly, possibly because the person was born with a mutation in that gene and has Lynch syndrome, then that protein will be missing in the tumor. And this image you see on the left side of the screen is an example of that. Here you can see nice brown nuclear staining of MSH2 and MSH6, but absence of MLH1 and PMS2, which indicates that there's a problem potentially with the MLH1 gene in this patient. Could be Lynch syndrome, could be something acquired, but again, it's identifying a group of patients that are more likely to have Lynch syndrome so that you can follow up with those patients and offer them genetic testing which would actually confirm the diagnosis. So neither of these screening tests confirms the diagnosis. They just identify patients more likely to have it. But this has become very important in the last two years because it turns out any patient with colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer for that matter who has this microsatellite instability characteristic in their tumor seems to really benefit from immune therapy. Um, new drugs targeting anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 have been shown to be very effective in patients with microsatellite unstable tumors. 
So this is something that a lot of oncologists would like to know for their patients for treatment purposes as well. So these tests form a dual purpose, one, identifying patients who are more likely to have Lynch syndrome, and two, identifying patients who are more likely to benefit from immune therapy. We did a study in the city of Columbus back in 1999 through 2008 where we were first trying to show that in the United States you could actually do the screening test on all newly diagnosed colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer patients and that it was even feasible that patients would agree to do it, that we could find patients with Lynch syndrome. And this um, is some of the earliest work in universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, which I'll review with you now. And it was funded by the National Cancer Institute. There's the grant number here on the slide. All told, over a five-year period, we enrolled over 1,500 colorectal cancer patients, and they all had the microsatellite instability test, and 12% had that microsatellite instability, indicating, again, that they were more likely to have Lynch syndrome, but also, as we now know, more likely to benefit from immune therapy if it was needed. They got follow-up genetic testing um, and additional testing to uh, see if that immunohistochemistry test worked, um, to look for an acquired cause of MLH1 absence, and um, full genetic testing to see if they did, in fact, have Lynch syndrome. And we found that 44 of the 1,566 patients did have Lynch syndrome for a prevalence of 2.8%, which is actually quite high. It's around 1 in 30 individuals with colon cancer who have a Lynch syndrome, which makes this, again, one of the most common conditions in the world. We also looked at a group of over 560 endometrial cancer patients. With endometrial cancer, there's a higher proportion that have that microsatellite instability. We found 23% in our cohort from Columbus. They got the additional testing, and interestingly, a very similar prevalence of Lynch syndrome was found among all newly diagnosed endometrial cancer patients. So it's been somewhat surprising to us that it's been a little bit easier for most institutions to implement universal tumor screening for colorectal cancer than it has been for endometrial cancer. If the purpose was to identify patients with Lynch syndrome, the prevalence is the same. And now that we have the added benefit of identifying patients who can benefit from immune therapy, endometrial cancer patients have more to gain since almost a quarter of them have the microsatellite instability characteristic and could benefit from that therapy. We looked a little closer at the colon cancer patients that we found to have Lynch syndrome in the citywide study and found that they were a little different from the patients you usually see in a high-risk genetics clinic. For example, the average age of diagnosis was older than what had been previously published for Lynch syndrome based on high-risk clinics with an average age of 51, but they ranged from being diagnosed with colon cancer at 23 all the way up to 87. Importantly, half of the patients found to have Lynch syndrome were diagnosed after age 50, which was important because some people at the time were considering maybe only doing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome in young patients, and we were able to show that half of the Lynch syndrome cases would have been missed. Also, um, somewhat disappointingly for me as a genetic counselor, we were able to show that the family history criteria um, that were well known at the time, the Amsterdam and Bethesda criteria, actually would not have performed very well in this group, and we would have missed a quarter of the cases with Lynch syndrome had we only referred patients who met the family history criteria. The mutation spectrum was a little different, too. You start to see many more MSH6 and PMS2 gene mutations in a population-based cohort than you do in a high-risk clinic where you're going to see much more MLH1 and MSH2 mutations since these are higher-risk Lynch syndrome genes. The next step in the study was the probably the most important step, and that is once we found those individuals with Lynch syndrome, offering genetic counseling and testing to all of their at-risk relatives. This is now referred to as cascade testing, and this is um, when you follow the mutation through the family. So, for example, we know when we identify a patient with Lynch syndrome that half of their brothers and sisters and half of their children will also have inherited Lynch syndrome. We know that they will have inherited it from their mother or their father, meaning that their aunts and uncles on one of the sides of the family will also be at risk. Once you identify which aunts and uncles are at risk, they can be tested, and you only need to test your cousins if the aunt or uncle who is the parent of those cousins 
also has the mutation. So this can save money and be very cost effective, and these are individuals at very, very high risk for having Lynch syndrome, so it's so-called low-hanging fruit to get as many relatives as possible tested once a family is diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. In our citywide study, we were able to test almost 300 additional relatives and found 130 additional relatives who were positive for Lynch syndrome. And importantly, most of these relatives are unaffected individuals who had never had cancer yet, and so they were identified in time to benefit from the intensive surveillance guidelines that we discussed earlier, potentially um, preventing cancer diagnoses and hopefully at the very least catching them early when they're treatable. So on average, we tested about six relatives per patient diagnosed with Lynch syndrome, revealing an additional three with Lynch syndrome. The trouble is clinically, um, we don't seem to do this well. A nice study by Yuri Ladebaum found that we, on average, test about 3.6 relatives per patient diagnosed with Lynch syndrome and only about one test positive in the clinical setting. And I think the reasons for this is that um, in the clinical setting, the patients usually are referred to a local provider who they may or may not um, schedule with, and they have to you know, drive sometimes a distance and go in for that counseling. They're billed for the counseling. They're billed for the testing. And, and these are barriers sometimes for getting those family members in. In our citywide study, the counseling was free. The testing was free. And most importantly, I think, we provided it locally by traveling to the patients themselves and to their families. So we provided the counseling at family reunions, at um, local churches, local doctor's offices, um, in their house. If they could get five at-risk relatives in the same place, we went to them. And that was, um, we have found, much more effective way of doing cascade testing than simply making referrals and hoping for the best. So after that study, there was a lot of work done, and um, one of the most important things was that universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome was proven to be cost effective, with an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $31,000 per life year saved. And experts agree that anything less than $50,000 per life year saved is a cost effective intervention. So this was a really good sign. And subsequently, universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome was recommended by a number of professional organizations for both colorectal cancer patients, but also for endometrial cancer patients. So what's the problem? Unfortunately, what we've seen is a really slow adoption of universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. If we look at uh, back in 2012, there was a survey done of a subset of cancer hospitals, and 71% of the NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers that were surveyed were performing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome at that time. But as you can see, only 15 to 36% of community oncology programs were performing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, and this is where about 80% of cancer patients are treated in the community. So those patients are getting um, disparate care. They're not getting this universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome that we've now shown uh, is feasible and cost effective. And so that was the impetus behind our statewide study, which we just ended accrual to. This was a study um, performed in the whole state of Ohio from uh, 2013 through 2016, but it's ongoing uh, with family members, supported by internal funding at Ohio State. So here you can see that we have 50 hospitals participating throughout the state of Ohio. This is a 50-mile radius drawn around those 50 hospitals just to show that we have good coverage of the whole state. And we do have patients enrolled in the study who have colorectal cancer who live in all 88 counties in Ohio. We have performed a lot of testing. This is a complicated testing algorithm. There's over 3,350 patients enrolled altogether, uh, but we pulled the numbers when 2,510 had completed their testing. And so if you walk down from the top of the slide with me, the first thing that we did was the microsatellite instability test and the immunohistochemistry test. And if either of those were positive, the tumor was considered to have defective mismatch repair. So we found that in about 15% of our tumors, and all of these, remember, would benefit from immune therapy if needed. The next step was to figure out whether that was due to acquired MLH1 methylation, which is a common cause of defective mismatch repair that's not Lynch syndrome, or not. And so we actually tested for that methylation, and it was present in 63% of those tumors with defective mismatch repair, that's the gray box. Um, but it was not present in 36.8% of those tumors. 
And so that left 142 patients who were eligible for genetic testing because their tumor had defective mismatch repair and it was not due to acquired methylation. Those patients underwent a, a next generation sequencing panel for multiple colorectal cancer genes and we found uh, 96 patients to have a hereditary cancer syndrome, or 3.8% of the total. 90 had Lynch syndrome, 10 had other syndromes, and the reason that does not total 96 is that we had four patients who had two syndromes. This did leave 46 patients with defective mismatch repair in their tumor that was not explained by a hereditary cancer syndrome. We did perform tumor sequencing in these patients and found 43 of the 46 had double somatic mutations in their mismatch repair genes, which is a known cause, uh, not due to Lynch syndrome, of having a defective mismatch repair colon cancer. And these patients' family members do not need increased screening for Lynch syndrome. The three who did not have double somatic mutations and all of the hundred who had hereditary cancer syndromes got genetic counseling and cascade testing was offered to their family. Importantly in this study, we were actually able to do some testing in the patients who had proficient mismatch repair or methylation. So these are the orange box at the top and the gray box, which historically don't get testing because they are unlikely to have Lynch syndrome. But in this study, we were able to test those that met clinical criteria of being young at diagnosis, having a first degree relative with colon or endometrial cancer, or having multiple colon or endometrial cancers themselves. So we had 924 patients who met those clinical criteria. They also got a multi-gene cancer panel called MyRisk from Myriad, and we found an additional 65 patients with a hereditary cancer syndrome. Most of these did not have Lynch syndrome, but there were, in fact, four cases of Lynch syndrome, and this just goes to show that the sensitivity of MSI and IHC is not 100%. Some cases of Lynch syndrome do get missed through those tests, but the vast majority obviously were picked up in the other arm. But this was an additional 2.6% of patients with a hereditary cancer syndrome, just um, showing that not, we don't catch all the hereditary cancer syndromes by doing MSI or IHC, we just catch most of the Lynch syndrome. And all of those patients with a hereditary cancer syndrome also got genetic counseling. And this study is continuing as we speak. We did enrolled a small group of endometrial cancer patients um, and only were able to test the patients with defective mismatch repair and we're at 3.2% Lynch here. So again, a little higher than in the Columbus study, perhaps because of improved testing over the years, um, and, and, but we're not, you know, we're close. It's somewhere around that uh, 3 to 4% range. We have tested uh, cascade testing in 355 relatives of these individuals with Lynch syndrome have 114 additional mutation positives, 200 mutation negatives, and tests pending. Um, so this is ongoing, but this is, of course, again, one of the most important parts of the study because we have shown that the more relatives that get tested, the more cost-effective the program is. And I will end there and turn things over to Deb Duquette. And they will just, oh no, to Greg, sorry. And they're just going to switch Greg to the host as we speak. Fair enough. I hope all of you can hear me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, Heather and David have uh, really given some uh, great uh, information. Um, and I'll be talking to you today uh, about um, something that is uh, near and dear to my heart. How do you um, make um, these sorts of activities applicable to uh, diverse care settings. And a couple of disclaimers to this. First, I speak for myself and not um, the Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency Program where I'm on faculty, uh, and nor do I speak for the Journal of the American Medical Association where I'm an associate editor for genomics. And, and lastly, um, diverse care settings can mean different things to different individuals. Um, for today's purposes, I'm going to be speaking from a place I understand, which is uh, rural primary care. I, uh, I see patients in central Maine. Uh, the town I practice in has approximately 5,000 patients in it, and we have relatively little access uh, to uh, genetic services in comparison to someone who may be practicing around a major city. So quite clearly, primary care providers and the primary health care system have a role in identifying individuals at risk for hereditary cancers and particularly Lynch syndrome, but also hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, 
there are a myriad uh, of potential roles primary care uh, often has in caring for these individuals from uh, their initial identification through ensuring that they get long-term surveillance perhaps after they've developed a cancer, uh, been treated, and then uh, go back into the primary care setting. For today, we'll be talking, I'll be talking predominantly about the issue of identifying individuals at risk and making sure they get into proper uh, screening um, and counseling. Um, and this, this presents some challenges um, for those in primary care. So a lot of that has to do simply with the numbers of uh, and reality um, associated with cancer syndromes, which though are reasonably um, common, are not that common in primary care practice. So just for the purposes of comparison, um, I, I put together this slide that uh, goes over the size of uh, integrated healthcare system, uh, in this case, the Kaiser Northern California system, and our residency program. Um, at Kaiser Northern California, according to the website, covers about 4 million patients. Our residency covers roughly 20,000 in Central Maine. Kaiser Northern California has 71 hospitals. We have one. They have 238 medical offices. We have three. Um, uh, they have about 7,600 physicians. We have about 80, including our residents and fellows. Um, and Kaiser encompasses six regional genetics clinics, which presumably have each a number of genetics uh, health professionals. We have zero on staff at our residency or even in our hospital, though we do have some access uh, to genetics professionals uh, through other hospital systems in our state. Now, you take this even one step further and think about uh, the perspective, uh, size perspective of a solo practitioner. Um, they may have a 1,000 patients, one hospital, one medical office, and one physician, and uh, highly variable, particularly in rural setting, uh, access to genetic services. And so what are the consequences of those orders of magnitude of scale difference between those systems? Assume, assume which roughly affects one in 500 individuals. It's probably a bit more uh, uh, prevalent in the population than one in 500. But just for easy calculations, assume one in 500. That means that Kaiser in their system may have 6,000 individuals affected by Lynch syndrome. Um, our residency might have 40, and a solo doc may have two in their patient panel. This translates to some challenges for the solo practitioner in a rural environment or a residency program like ours in a relatively genetically under-resourced environment, um, in that to scale up um, uh, detection of these individuals, whether you're talking about doing it through um, um, universal screening of tumor or through family history um, uh, requires a certain amount of infrastructure cost. And that infrastructure cost is granted larger in Kaiser um, than it would be for a solo doc. But relatively speaking, the, the economy of scale for setting up systems to detect and manage these individuals greatly favors systems that have large numbers of uh, at-risk people in their population. Um, Likewise, um, the incentives for gearing up to detect individuals uh, at risk for Lynch syndrome favor uh, uh, systems that operate in a closed way. In other words, they're essentially self-insured and uh, can see the benefit of ascertaining these individuals in their population, providing them with long-term management, and reducing their risk of developing incident uh, cancers. Um, in our residency environment, and, and for many solo docs, although again, they're a vanishing breed, um, um, the incentives for um, spending uh, uh, lots of time on uh, detection of relatively uncommon conditions like the familial cancer syndromes um, uh, weigh, weigh against um, um, uh, much investment in, in this area. So I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth a bit there just to make sure that I'm on the right side. So, in our uh, environment, we recently had a lecture from our hospital's um, Office of Prevention, uh, and they came in to present some relatively startling data to us about uh, uh, the topic of food insecurity in our population in central Maine, which is relatively poor. And it was really eye-opening for our office. And we found that about one in five in children that we care for may come from a food insecure household and um, um, roughly the same number of seniors uh, come from a similar environment. 
and they presented reasonably credible um, uh, data to suggest that there are tools to screen for food insecurity and that, in fact, uh, resources for these individuals are underutilized in our state and that we ought to be doing a better job of detecting these folks. In primary care, you're often faced with the issue of opportunity cost. There are many things we could be doing for our patients at all times. We are on a daily basis trying to decide uh, which of those have a priority and that we're going to be tackling. Um, and I would just put forward um, um, for folks on the call that they think about this issue of opportunity cost and, and frame it in, in this way of thinking, that in our population at least, um, food insecurity is 100 times more prevalent than uh, Lynch syndrome. Um, and if you're a relatively small uh, practice, um, um, where would you, if you have limited resources, both in terms of time and dollars, where would you spend those uh, precious resources um, in terms of getting the most um, outcome, uh, improved outcomes for your patients. So some of the barriers to universal lint screening. First, there's a perception, I think, among many health providers in primary care that the condition is relatively rare and they don't have many patients. Um, they clearly have educational needs, both around this perception of relative rarity and uh, regarding the value of um, finding individuals with Lynch and making sure they get proper counseling, testing, and then uh, downstream services. Um, there are issues around reimbursement regarding the time it takes to ascertain these individuals in primary care environments, um, 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 or in fact, uh, for if an individual comes back to you after universal screening is found to be at risk, ensuring that you take the time in your office to um, connect them to proper downstream services and then manage their care longitudinally throughout their lifespan. Um, and often we face uh, challenges around subpar systems for communication, um, recording in electronic medical records of uh, uh, mutation information or even um, recommendations for enhanced screening that stray from those um, um, uh, screening recommendations for people who are at baseline risk for cancers in the population. So in our environment, we've recently undertaken a very small um, pilot project funded by the Maine Cancer Foundation that attempts to tackle some of these issues. Recognize that this project isn't centered around universal lynch screening from the perspective of tumor testing, but rather starting with a, a broader um, um, uh, funnel, if you will, of using family history information, which is reasonably readily available in primary care settings to identify people who are at risk for hereditary uh, um, breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, as well as Lynch syndrome. The program uh, that we've created has uh, three components to it, a uh, educational component for our uh, uh, health professionals, both our trainees and our faculty. Um, it has a uh, service delivery and health systems um, development component to it, and then an evaluative component. The basic core of the program is the idea that we could establish in the context of the patient-centered medical homes that we have in our practices, a wellness visit that instead of focusing on diabetes or obesity, focuses on cancer family history. And essentially what we've done is empower uh, anyone in our practices to make uh, a referral on the basis of either a patient or provider request to one of our nurses for a uh, nurse cancer family history visit. The nurses and the providers are um, given um, um, resources uh, to assess family history, which the patients complete prior to the nurse wellness visit to help stratify the risk. And we have attempted to develop seamless downstream processes for making sure that individuals who go through the family history wellness visit and are identified to be at higher risk are referred to appropriate genetic services offered through um, the um, uh, Maine Medical Center at uh, Portland. We also have spent some time in this project and are just entering into the phase of really working on this, uh, uh, working on essentially communication coming back from uh, the genetic services provider. So one of the challenges that I hear time and again from primary care providers is uh, the ability to translate the often lengthy um, genetic consultation notes and testing results 
into action steps in the office. Um, so we're working on both um, the form of um, referral letters um, and, uh, and their structure, as well as developing the concept of a debriefing visit for um, patients in this context of the patient medical center medical hall, which uh, um, essentially encompasses an evaluation of what comes back from genetic services and uh, uh, codifying that in the medical record and their long-term uh, health care management plan. Um, we also recently have entered into a program um, that provides another very much needed um, aspect, which is patient support for people at risk for hereditary cancer syndromes. We've teamed up with uh, the folks from uh, FORCE. Um, they have recently received a grant to um, pilot a program of uh, peer navigators in uh, several rural states um, that help patients who are identified as being at risk to navigate the healthcare system from testing through potentially treatment um, and downstream um, um, screening and or surveillance. So I leave you with basically these final thoughts. Never forget perspective. Um, Many people in academic medical centers um, where um, uh, actually a minority of uh, cancer patients are seen and treated um, um, live essentially on the beach um, in this picture. They know that there are folks out there at risk for hereditary cancer syndrome. Think of them as the fishes swimming in the ocean. Um, and they are right now, Heather's done a fantastic job, Deb is doing a great job in her state, coming up with strategies uh, to essentially be able to get to those fish on the reef um, or patients in the clinic. Um, and the tools that one develops um, are very logical. Um, if you're um, in the context of a, a large health system or an academic medical center, uh, snorkel and mask would be an admirable uh, set of tools for reaching the fish um, on the beach. Um, but some of us, at least, live in an environment which is much more akin to this view of the beach. Um, and we need to be very cognizant of the fact that some of the tools that may be uh, necessary aren't necessarily sufficient for helping folks in under-resourced environments do a better job of ascertaining individuals at risk for hereditary um, uh, cancer syndrome, such as Lynch syndrome. So um, in conclusion, um, attach, approaches uh, to tackling familial cancer syndrome detection, universal screening or otherwise, must take the care setting into account. Um, addressing structural issues is necessary but not necessarily sufficient for progress. Um, and carefully considering um, the timing and the introduction of a high demand and potentially low yield intervention into a healthcare ecosystem uh, needs to be um, um, at the fore of any planning process. Um, when opportunity costs are there. And my last slide, uh, Jess Banks, uh, collaborators at the Maine Medical Center, the Jackson Laboratory Force, the Maine General Health Prevention Center, and uh, lastly, the Maine Cancer Foundation, who provided funding for our small pilot project. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Thank you to the organizers of this Research to Reality Cyber Webinar for inviting the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to present on our work to expand Lynch syndrome screening best practices. It is quite an honor to be presenting today. If you have any questions following today's webinar, please do not hesitate to give me a, a, either a phone call or email at the following address. Michigan is proud to be one of the five states, including Oregon, Connecticut, Utah, and Michigan, that received a five-year cooperative agreement from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to enhance our state health department's capacities to promote and apply evidence-based cancer genomics guidelines in public health. Each of the currently funded states must conduct education, surveillance, and policy activities to advance hereditary breast and ovarian cancer best practices and states also have the option of adding Lynch syndrome activities to their work. Today's presentation will be focused on some of our Lynch syndrome efforts. The funded states are also required to have key partnerships with internal and external partners, including cancer registries, cancer genetic clinics, universities, and nonprofits. The funded states are also encouraged to target populations at higher risk for hereditary cancers in underserved areas. 
In Michigan, we are working to overcome barriers and advance health system changes to promote cancer genomic best practices with the ultimate goal of reducing incidence and mortality of cancers related to Lynch syndrome and hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. We work on promoting an entire spectrum of hereditary cancer genomic best practices, including universal screening on newly diagnosed colorectal cancers, as described by Heather and Greg, and also promoting the importance of documentation and collection of personal and family cancer history, followed by risk assessment and referral for additional evaluation and screening of appropriate cases, as also described by Greg. We also strongly recommend genetic counseling prior to hereditary cancer DNA testing with written informed consent as required by our state law. Appropriate clinical management and cascade screening for high-risk relatives as described by Heather. Michigan has conducted data, have collected data on public awareness and provider practice of hereditary colorectal cancers that demonstrate significant needs and areas for improvement. For instance, based on the 2010 Michigan BRFS, which is a statewide phone survey, it was found that nearly 80% of the 7.5% of Michigan adults with a personal or family history of colorectal cancer were not even aware of hereditary colorectal cancer testing availability. And only 3% of these individuals had had such testing. Additionally, based on an actual review of over 600 colorectal cancer charts diagnosed in Michigan in 2006 to 2010, less than 2% had documentation of Lynch syndrome screening. We currently estimate that at least 20,000 Michigan residents have Lynch syndrome, and most are not aware of their eligibility for testing. There is much work to be done to achieve the Lynch Syndrome Healthy People 2020 objective, as described by David, and to increase awareness of hereditary colorectal cancer. We are thankful to have a number of incredible partners, including the Michigan Cancer Consortium, which is a statewide network of over 100 organizations working to improve cancer outcomes for Michigan residents. The Michigan Cancer Consortium has embraced the Lynch Syndrome Healthy People 2020 efforts in the current state cancer plan, which includes an objective and strategies to increase the percentage of newly diagnosed colorectal cancers screened for Lynch Syndrome in Michigan. The statewide strategies include providing patient and provider education, promoting national standards such as EGAP, and increasing cancer genomics best practices among Michigan health plans. The Michigan Cancer Consortium represents one of our instrumental state health, depart health partners. We also have joint activities with several multi-level partners, including national organizations, state and local partners, clinics and providers, and families and individuals. We are especially excited in Michigan about the recent Cancer Moonshot Blue Ribbon Panel recommendation for prevention and early detection, as described by David, which elevates the Lynch Syndrome Healthy People 2020 and our state cancer plan objective as an important nationwide priority for evidence-based implementation. We are quite thankful that the importance of cascade screening, clinical trials, and access to genetic counseling for Lynch Syndrome patients and families are included in the Blue Ribbon Panel recommendation. In order to achieve the Lynch Syndrome Healthy People 2020 objective, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, in partnership with the CDC, the Ohio State University, Huntsman Cancer Institute, and Emory University, created the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network, also called LESSON, with the vision to reduce the cancer burden associated with Lynch Syndrome by promoting universal Lynch Syndrome screening on all newly diagnosed colorectal cancer and endometrial cancers and to facilitate the ability of all health systems to implement appropriate screening by sharing resources and protocols. There is no cost for institutions to join, and there are currently 95 leading cancer health systems and others who are members and partners of LESSON. LESSON maintains an active listserv and a website that has multiple resources to assist institutions to implement universal Lynch syndrome screening. The current 95 lesson members are located in 30 states and three countries, including the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. Based on recent lesson membership data, there have been approximately 44,000 cancers screened for Lynch syndrome by lesson members since 2008, with significant annual increases reported, especially since 2014. 
The initial screen performed by the majority of lesson members is typically IHC, as described by Heather. The majority of lesson members typically begin universal lymph syndrome screening on colorectal cancers, and then after about two to three years, decide to add endometrial cancers to their screening program. Although it is quite unusual for a state health department to be a founder and chair of such a national network, we are pleased to fill this important need for health systems and also proud that the largest number of lesson members are in our state of Michigan. The Michigan Cancer Surveillance Program, which is our state cancer registry, has been another instrumental and critical partner for our surveillance, education, and policy activities. With our state cancer registry, we have been able to monitor the number of potential cases appropriate for further Lynch syndrome assessment in our state. Examples of cancer cases appropriate for further risk evaluation for Lynch syndrome include colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancers, especially diagnosed at a young age, and multiple primary cancers. We have found that approximately 6,275 of these types of cancers are reported per year in Michigan. This surveillance data has been used in a number of ways, including disseminating information back to the over 150 reporting healthcare facilities in Michigan with educational materials, including information on how and where to refer such cases for clinical cancer genetic assessment. We have also conducted quality assurance chart audits to assess cancer family history documentation, Lynch syndrome screening, counseling, and testing. These chart reviews led to the discovery of needed improvements for family history documentation and the need for greater referrals for Lynch syndrome counseling and screening. These surveillance activities also resulted in policy changes and educational initiatives for local cancer registers, registrars in Michigan about the types of hereditary cancer testing performed and the importance of family and personal history of specific cancers. Our state health department has also created a network of the cancer genetic clinics with board certified genetic professionals in Michigan that provide de-identified data about their cancer genetic counseling visits and testing. As shown on the green map on this slide, most of these clinics are located in southern Michigan. By utilizing our state cancer registry data, we have identified counties in Michigan with a higher age-adjusted incidence and mortality of specific cancers appropriate for hereditary cancer screening. For instance, as shown in the middle figure, the map with the counties in red are those with a higher age-adjusted incidence of colorectal cancer. As shown, many of these red counties are in the thumb area of Mich Michigan, which currently have no cancer genetic counseling, counseling clinics. We are therefore working to increase access to genetic services for individuals in these counties and creating tailored primary care provider education, such as in-person workshops and other provider activities with the 11 health systems in the thumb area. Our state cancer genomics program with key state partners such as the Michigan Cancer Genetics Alliance and Michigan Association of Health Plans also promote timely and relevant messages by authoring articles on Lynch syndrome and other hereditary cancers for newsletters and other publications that are disseminated to thousands of partners, providers, and health plan administrators. For instance, this month's Michigan Cancer Consortium article highlights the Lynch syndrome cancer moonshot blue ribbon panel recommendation and also provides other hereditary colorectal cancer updates. Impacting and supporting individuals and families with Lynch syndrome and other hereditary cancers is the impetus for all of our activities. And we recognize the great importance of advocacy and support groups as vital resources. Our State Health Department Cancer Genomics Program is proud to partner with several national and local support groups, including the first of two such local groups in our state for individuals with Lynch syndrome and other hereditary colorectal cancers, which is supported by the Cancer Support Community in Ann Arbor and Gilda's Club in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Importantly, tomorrow, March 22nd, is Lynch Syndrome Awareness Day and has been recognized in several states with efforts such as governor's proclamations. It is an honor to acknowledge the amazing national and local hereditary colorectal cancer advocates and to join efforts to promote Lynch Syndrome Awareness. In Michigan, our Governor Snyder has proclaimed the entire week as Lynch Syndrome Awareness Week. 
In June, Michigan also celebrated FAP awareness in recognition of the 90th birthday of a Michigan individual with FAP. This Michigan rec resident may in fact be the oldest living known individual with FAP and is a true testimony to the potential longevity of individuals with hereditary cancers. And I'd like to thank all of our the amazing individuals and our incredible partners who make our work possible. And I'd also like, like to thank each and every one of you for your interest and attendance at today's webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you for those wonderful presentations. Um, we have just a few minutes left, and so we will hopefully be able to answer a couple of questions, but we'll also continue this discussion on research to reality. You'll get an email about that after the cyber seminar ends. So we've unmuted all of our speakers, and again, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. Just type in your questions, select the option to send it to all panelists, and hit submit. So our first question is from Juan Carlos. And he wants to know, would there ever be a situation where a colorectal cancer patient doesn't get tumor testing? Or in what case would someone not get tumor testing in general? So Greg, we could start with you, um, or anybody is welcome to answer. Sure, I, I would say that uh, depending on what uh, healthcare system you're receiving your care, there is uh, quite a chance that you could experience um, 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 a lack of testing for hereditary um, um, you know, Lynch syndrome. Um, and I think there's actually some available data, and I'm sure Heather and Deb Duquette could speak to this as well, that even in systems where there is, in theory, universal testing, that uh, every tumor isn't tested every time. And so I think it's pretty important to consider um, uh, essentially a safety net for those individuals um, uh, uh, that makes use of family history where uh, the importance of family history taking is stressed uh, at the level of primary as well as specialty care. Yeah, um, Greg, I would just add that um, certainly universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome is not universal yet. Um, unfortunately, as you saw in the statistics I, I provided, um, only 15 to 36 percent of community-based hospitals were per performing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome back in uh, 2012. Hopefully that has, we expect that's improved since then, but um, we have to repeat the study to get better better numbers for now. But I think it's, it's very likely this could happen. And so um, two points. One is I think uh, for anyone who is listening who is a colorectal cancer patient, um, you can certainly ask your doctor if your tumor was screened for Lynch syndrome. Um, and, and find out. And the lucky thing is, number two, this can be done at any time as long as the tumor block is still uh, at the hospital where you had your surgery. Many people don't realize that hospitals keep tumor blocks from your surgery um, for a minimum amount of time. It varies from state to state. In Ohio, they have to keep them at least 10 years. Um, but I have actually pulled tumor blocks from 1956 and been able to perform tumor screening on them. Uh, for Lynch syndrome. So it's very possible if this was not done or you were diagnosed several years ago and it was not done that it could still be done today. Um, so that's something def definitely that you should ask about, um, particularly if your um, cancer has uh, advanced and you're having uh, trouble uh, finding a therapy that you're responding to. There is this benefit now for immune therapy, um, which only works in the microcellular unstable colon mitral cancer patients, and so it could be very important to your treatment. Okay, great. And did you want to add anything, Deb? Um, I think Heather covered that very thorough, so I think she did a great job with that. Um, and I would just once again echo both Heather and Greg's thoughts, too, that at least in Michigan, it is tends to be the more larger health systems that have implemented the universal screening um, and the smaller community hospitals um, have, are, are a little bit later adopters to this, um, but it does tend to be, like as stated before, the community hospitals um, are, are ones that we're definitely trying to promote, especially in those more rural areas. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so now we'll go to a question from Gina Cardinali. Thank you for this question. What are the related national research priorities that I should be aware of? 
and are there upcoming NCI RFAs that I should be looking out for? Uh, so I think it's David. I, I think that's probably a question uh, best suited for me. So uh, first of all, I thought that you know we referenced it relatively briefly, and of course uh, Heather and, and Dev and, and Greg were, were part of this. Um, but the workshop that was on February 22nd and 23rd, uh, and, and information on NCI's website is available in terms of the agenda, I thought did a really nice job of pulling together over the course of the day and a half uh, a whole set of potential opportunities for research. There was a lot of discussion about what would act, what kind of capacity in terms of the workforce, uh, what, what uh, very di different tests that may be available, how does one create a better system, and what are some of the systemic challenges around trying to uh, scale up uh, universal tumor testing, uh, cascade screening of, of relatives, et cetera. Um, so just to, just to think about and, and potentially uh, view some of the materials from that workshop as uh, potential research priorities to think about. Um, as far as the process for NCI going forward in terms of initiatives, uh, there are uh, there are groups that have been um, brought together of, of NCI and other staff to think through next steps in each area. So uh, I think what you'll likely see over the coming months are a whole range of different initiatives across the topics of the Blue Ribbon Panel. And as uh, was mentioned on here, uh, one of the uh, clear uh, areas is hereditary cancers, and, and Lynch syndrome was seen as a nice case of that. So I would just say, you know, keep an eye out over the over the coming months as to a, a whole range of next steps related to, to Blue Ribbon Panel and Moonshot. Okay, great. And the next question from Shay Austin: What are a few best practices with community partners, uh, i.e., nonprofits, nonprofits, clinics, et cetera, that have helped with Lynch syndrome testing enrollment? So does anybody have any experience with that? Maybe Heather? Um, so I'm, it, this sounds like maybe, I'm not sure if this is trying to get some of the smaller um, institutions to implement universal tumor screening or to identify um, patients who are at risk and get them referred to cancer genetics. Um, though if it's the, the former, um, that website that Deb Duquette mentioned from Lesson, the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network, which is www.lynchscreening.net, has um, lots and lots of information to help an institution kind of move through the different readiness stages to implementing universal tumor screening for Lynch Syndrome. We thought no one should have to recreate the wheel, so we have everything up there, flow charts for how to do it, who the stakeholders are, tip sheets, um, uh, a sample letters to patients, sample pathology reports, um, anything you might need to try and implement universal tumor screening. So I highly recommend that website for people who are trying to do that. Um, if you're trying to help just kind of with general awareness uh, about Lynch syndrome and referring for family history, I think that, as um, Greg kind of really pointed out, is super important too because you know, we don't always want to wait till someone gets a cancer to figure out who has Lynch syndrome. We would like to identify these patients before they get a cancer, and that's where family history approaches can come in. And, and really simply um, being aware that um, certainly anyone with a colon or endometrial cancer diagnosed under age 50, anyone with multiple primary colon, uterine, ovarian, or stomach cancers, or three cases total in their family should be referred to a genetics provider for consideration of uh, genetic testing, I think is a, a really great kind of basic recommendation for everybody. All right, and then, um, oh, this, go is, ahead. this is. Oh, this is Deb Duquette. I'm going to just put out a couple of shout outs. There's some, um, I'm not sure if that question um, was getting at, at what Heather answered or if it was getting more at um, different efforts that are done with advocacy partners or nonprofits. Um, and so if that question was about advocacy partners, please um, feel free to give us a call, Greg or myself or Heather. Um, there's an awful lot that's going on with different national partners, um, including different registries that are getting formulated. Um, also, the importance of cascade screening, one really great resource that I'll put out there was developed by University of California, San Francisco called Kin Talk. K-I-N, then talk, T-A-L-K dot org. It has wonderful information for families about Lynch syndrome and ways to share that with family members as well. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, we're coming up on 3 o'clock, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But, uh, Dana, I did want to let you know that we'll put your question up on the discussion on research to reality and have the presenters answer it on there. So, just again, I want to let everybody know about the discussion. It'll be in an email that you'll get after the end of the cyber seminar. Um, in that follow-up email, it'll have a link to that discussion and a link to a survey about the cyber seminar today. So, if you could take a couple minutes to fill that out, it would be really, really helpful for us. If you would like a copy of today's presentation, please email us with your request at research to reality at mail.nih.gov. Um, we sent that out just a little bit earlier through the chat box. So thank you for joining us for today's cyber seminar, and we want to give a special thank you to our presenters who did a great job. So have a great day. Thank you.